This week the weather was rainy, windy and stormy. I cancelled my lessons on Wednesday because the conditions were not near VFR minimums. On Thursday the conditions are better. Although the weather was not good enough for my first solo, it was sufficiently good for another lesson. So I took yep, the opportunity to fly with Victor and practice right hand circuits on runway 24, right. including power Wind engine up. failure and flapless Pull approaches back. with a bit of crosswind. The weather has been unfriendly for VFR flights during the last few days. You can see the predicted conditions just after 8 a.m. on Wednesday as reported on plane side. I took this screenshot at 5.15 a.m. looking at the available weather information to help me decide whether to go to Camden or reschedule. In the TAF, the terminal area forecast, you can see that winds, rain and clouds with a probability of 30% for thunderstorms means that today was not a good day to fly. Later that morning I chatted with Greg and we decided that Thursday's weather looked more promising so I booked a flight for 8 a.m. I was hoping that the weather would be good for a solo, and if it wasn't, I'd just do a lesson. Either way, I was flying on Thursday. So I arrived at Camden on Thursday morning, unsure exactly what would happen. I knew that it was a good chance I would fly, but I wasn't sure whether I'd had a good short for a solo or it'd be just another lesson. The problem was still the weather. The instructor can't send me on my first solo if the weather exceeds the CASA prescribed minimums. You can learn about the various rules about the first solo flight in paragraph 21.1.1 of Instructor Part 141 Flight Training Operations Manual. You can see the Word document on the CASA website. After a debate between Greg, Victor and George, we decided that a solo would not be possible. I was still keen to do a regular lesson, especially considering that runway 24 was in operation. This would allow me to practice right hand circuits for the second time. I would also practice flapless and glide approaches. Plus, I didn't want for an entire week to go past without a flight. For a student pilot to attempt the first solo flight in accordance with CASA regulations, specific minimum weather requirements must be met to ensure safety. These requirements are crucial to provide a safe environment for students as they gain practical flying experience. Here are the key weather conditions and factors that student pilots should consider. The minimum visibility for a student pilot's first solo flight typically needs to be at least five statute miles for day operations. Visibility of at least three statute miles is usually required for night operations. Students must maintain a certain distance from clouds to ensure visibility and safety. For Class G airspace, they are generally required to maintain at least 1,000 feet above the clouds, 500 feet below the clouds, and 2,000 feet horizontally from the clouds. The minimum ceiling height, the lowest overcast or broken cloud layer, should be no lower than 1,000 feet above ground level (AGL) for day operations. Night operations often require a higher ceiling of at least 1,500 feet AGL. Winds should be within manageable limits for the student pilot. Strong, gusty winds can make it the first solar flight more challenging and potentially unsafe. CASA regulations usually specify maximum crosswind components that student pilots can safely handle. Excessive turbulence can make flying difficult, especially for student pilots. Student pilots should avoid flying in areas with known turbulence or severe weather conditions. Before every flight, student pilots should receive a thorough weather briefing from a certified flying instructor or meteorologist. This briefing should include information on current weather conditions, forecasts and any relevant weather hazards. It's important to note that these weather requirements may vary based on specific flight schools, training programs and regional regulations. And for this flight, ATIS reported this. Camden, terminal information, Delta, expect instrument approach, runway 24, wind variable 5 knots, casual tailwind 3 knots, visibility greater than 10 kilometers, cloud scattered 1,600, temperature 2-3, QNH 1002. I've contact with Camden Tower or ground, notify receipt of information Delta. While I was doing the run-up checklist, we received a new ATIS report. And the one now, and the navigation I'll turn that on now as well. Camden information echoes now. Current changes wind 250 degrees, 14 knots. Clouds scattered at 2500, temperature 25. 
So we got um, 25 degrees temperature. But the wind changed as well, but I didn't get that. Two five zero degrees, fourteen knots. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same reaction. <laughs> All right. Um, it's your call. I can't send you solo though. Oh no, definitely not. So two five zero degrees. Uh, where's getting? Okay. Two five zero means it's coming. So this is two four. It's coming. Uh, as we got going to be taking off, let's orient like this. Two five zero is coming like this, right? Oh, yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's no, coming it's like this. So yeah. we're landing like this. The wind's going to be coming here. Because remember, oh, the sorry, wind sorry. points this in the direction correct. of magnetic. Yeah, wind is coming from yep, two five. Right. This is pointing to. Yeah, yep. good. No, so we're going to have mostly. <laughs> it's okay. It's not the crosswind the problem. It's mostly headwind. Yeah. Uh, but it has been variable, so it's not necessarily two five zero. It can be variable as well. So look at the wind sock, right? Okay. It's like shifting. So it's still variable. So keep in mind that it could be more than fourteen knots crosswind if it's shifting, just All like right. that's doing. Uh, I'm not worried about the solo, but from a safety perspective, uh, because it's mostly crosswind, there is a variation. I think the variation was uh, three knots. Did you pick that up? It, was, it initially was variable three knots on, uh, on the forecast, but the eight is, look at that, look at the wind socks. Yeah, it's like, whoosh, and then whoosh. Hmm. It's currently two, five, zero degrees of 14 knots, but just, you got to build a picture. This is why we still use forecast. The forecast is variable. And look at the wind sock. It's kind of doing whatever it wants. So even though he reported two, five, zero degrees of 14, it doesn't mean it's only a two, five, zero. It could be coming from it could shift like this, it could shift like this. Yep. So you just got to be aware of that as you're coming down on final. You're going to have to be on top of your center line with your aileron. And that's really it. Safety right. wise, it's not an issue. Um, it could be a little bumpy. And I just got to consider these clouds here in downwind as well. All um, right. I'm, I'm happy to do at least a couple of absolutely. Uh, circles, circuits. Uh, you can always help me out. Like I don't, I don't have any go issue. <laughs> just for your expectation as well, yep. I'm going to request something called special VFR. Just because of the fact that we may not have correct cloud separation and we might have to do a couple of low level circuits, which is still good experience for you, um, but we might not be able to get to 1,300 feet like we Got really it. So we may need to stay a bit lower yeah. than usual. Yeah. Right. Although clouds had lifted by almost 1,000 feet, winds had become much stronger. So Victor asked me if I still wanted to go ahead with his lesson, and I did. So I continued the run up check and prepared for takeoff. In today's flight, I was able to fit eight circuits. The first two were regular approaches. I did a flopless approach in circuit three, a go around and a couple of glide approaches. I could do all of these approaches that the flight instructor would evaluate before deciding whether I was sufficiently competent to complete my first solo. Today's flight was my second session using runway 24 and I felt comfortable with it. The takeoff was easy and I kept the plane on the extended center line while climbing. I was mindful of the stronger than usual wind from 250 degrees, but didn't notice any difficulty keeping my heading. After my first flight with Victor, I wanted to use the runway threshold position against the plane to help me decide when to turn downwind and base. I practiced this technique and noticed that my turns from crosswind to downwind were generally consistent. Any variation had to do more with when I turned crosswind. I turned crosswind after climbing past 800 feet, which can happen at different points in the upwind leg. Second is that my turns have varying radii, especially those from crosswind to downwind and downwind to base. Some are more tight than others, and this tends to make some circuits wide. Third, my turns from downwind to base should be on time, as you can see in the Flight Radar 24 recording. In the Flight Radar 24 recording, the approach in circuits 3 and 6 is obviously closer to the runway than the rest because these uh, were glide approaches. I couldn't reach the runway in circuit 3 because I delayed the turn towards the runway. And the correct procedure in an engine failure at downwind is to commence the turn to the runway immediately. I delayed the turn for a few seconds, which made it impossible to make the runway. In circuit 6, however, I managed the glide approach better and reached the runway. In the end, I used power to avoid a touchdown before the depressed threshold on runway 24. 
In previous lessons, I would fly most of the final leg with power on idle. Today, I use considerable power to keep the plane on the extended center line. Why? Because I had almost 14 knots of wind blowing from 250 degrees. I used around 1500 RPM to get the plane safely over the threshold at the correct speed. In my first two circuits during the late final, I allowed the speed to drop very low, almost 50 knots. Remember, before touchdown, speed should be 60 knots. This speed differential is important because it brings the plane closer to its stall speed, which is 45 knots approximately. I must be very careful with speed, especially at that critical moment, which is final and landing. Allowing such a low airspeed reduces the margin of safety. As Victor explained, if a tailwind gust blows at that moment, it only takes about 10 knots to cause a stall, and the plane would just fall like a brick. You can listen to the conversation at 58 minutes in the video. I almost had a tail strike on the last landing. In the last circuit, I did a glide approach, and because of the strong headwind, I decided not to use flaps. This was just another first. In all previous glide approaches, I had deployed flaps once I was confident I could reach the runway. In this approach, though, I didn't because of the strong headwind. I actually think that this approach was well done. However, I raised the plane's nose too much, just before touchdown. A little more, and the tail would have hit the runway. Is this a thing? Look. Yeah. Careful. Oh, yeah, that's close. <laughs> Uh, tail strike, yes. right? yeah. I was lucky with this one. Uh, this was just another example of how quickly things can change. An otherwise good approach and landing can morph into a nasty accident in the space of a second. I wish I had an external video recording to see how close to a tail strike I was. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. Just click on the subscribe button below the video. And of course, you can also head over to my detailed flight training log pages on the Tech Explorations website. In these pages, I document in detail all of my experiences and learnings from each one of my training flights. These logs contain a gold mine of information for any aviation student or anyone interested in aviation. Until next time, I wish you clear skies and safe landings.